But um, I'm looking forward to hearing what Ken has to tell us. So, ladies and gentlemen, Ken O'Keefe. I've been very blessed in the last uh, year in this country to experience firsthand what, what Brian is talking about. Um, I don't know how many in this audience would agree with me, but I think it's pretty clear that this world is completely upside down. Black is white, white is black. The truth is nothing but a word. And those of us who endeavor to seek the truth invariably come to some conclusions. And those of us who not only seek to understand the truth, but expose it, um, can expect some consequences, pretty predictable consequences as well. As an example, on a personal level, last year I was arrested. I was never charged, importantly, but I was arrested for fraud. Uh, <laughs> this was perfect, in my opinion, because the kind of work that I've done for the last uh, several years doesn't pay very well, that's for sure. And when I have had access to money, I haven't taken it, um, and I haven't even covered my expenses, and, and this has actually been a source of irritation, I can tell you, for my wife, who sees a, an able-bodied man who used to be a business owner who lived in Hawaii and is capable of providing, but has been basically unable to provide in financial terms because the work that I do consumes me, and it consumes me because I see the consequences of our failure to act with understanding and wisdom are so grave that it could literally translate to the end of the world as we know it. And, and, and a part of that process is, of course, the abuse of language. And it's fitting that this conference, the apocalypse, is a perfect example of a word that's been abused, um, like so many other words. But So being arrested for fraud in a world in which the fraudsters are the ones at the top of the pyramid and the puppets in government and whatnot, for me, is a great compliment. Really, it's perfect. If I was getting an award for charity or something like that, then you might want to question what it is that I'm doing. Um, but thankfully for me, you know, I've, I've had some really good relationships formed with some really beautiful people. Max Egan is one of them. But, uh, you know, I actually have now uh, a law firm here in London representing me, and I'm going after the police. You know, they're representing me completely pro bono going after the police for unlawful arrests, false imprisonment, assault, and two, uh, two violations of the European Convention on Human Rights. And the only reason why I'm, I'm getting this is, I guess, a good level of karmic uh, you know, payback or something, because I simply could not afford this. And that really gets us to the next issue, which is how they really get you with these laws as well, because if you don't have money, good luck to you. I'd have a lot of libel cases that I could be filing, you know, for people who slandered me, libeled me and whatnot. But I can't afford that. And good luck, you know, being able to afford a, a, a libel attorney. You better have a pretty good uh, bank deposit uh, you know, list in order to pay for something like that. Anyway, in this world, I was raised indoctrinated like all of us are. And I joined the Marine Corps at 19 years old thinking that my country was the greatest and that it was the bastion of freedom and democracy and all that sort of stuff. And ultimately, uh, it was an injustice that I experienced in the Marine Corps that woke me up. It was the best thing that ever happened to me, but very, very painful. I ended up speaking out against uh, abuse of power within the Marine Corps. And um, generally, that doesn't go over too well. But in the Marine Corps, especially the infantry, uh, this doesn't really go down very well. And, and ultimately, I realized what it was like to be hated by uh, a man who was directly in charge of me in a, in a situation in where we were going to war. Um, not a very pleasant situation to be in at all. And it was that taste of injustice that transformed me, radically transformed me, because I realized, well, if I was wrong about the Marine Corps, which I thought was about honor and integrity and leadership by example and stuff like that, what else am I wrong about? And it was at that point, after I got out of the Marine Corps, that I vowed, one, that I would never give up my freedom again. Never. I realized how stupid I was to basically sign the document enslaving myself. And I vowed I would exercise my freedom to the hilt. And ultimately, I've, I've been doing that for you know, 20 years since. And when I got out of the Marine Corps, I started to study 
independent uh, sources of information were my primary source and ultimately books like uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee uh, impacted me tremendously, uh, helped me understand what we did to American Indians and the level of deceit and fraud and murder and everything was just, a, it was an immense transformation reading books like that. I read uh, Noam Chomsky and you know I love Chomsky for his his way of helping me understand America and I, it saddens me that I have to accept the fact that this man as intelligent as he is doesn't speak the truth about 9-11 and other very important issues um, and there we go this is this matrix of control which is really it's it's very clever you have to give these bastards credit I mean they really do a good job of even if you think you're going in the right direction whoosh, they just swerve you off course and when I was discussing this with one of the people in the audience earlier, I think this is an important tactic for us to be able to gain important information, to not cut loose potentially valuable sources of information because their conclusions are wrong, because the best lies clearly are mostly true. It's that little bit of misdirection or omission that gets you. And you have to be a critical thinker. You have to use basic critical thinking spill skills to be able to identify that. But you shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And so Noam Chomsky for me was extremely important. He helped me understand especially American policy in Central and South America, but other places as well. And without him, you know, it would have taken me a, a lot longer. Um, but ultimately I realized many things and one of them was Palestine. I looked to Palestine and I realized, wow, wow. What an amazing job the propaganda machine, the powers that be, had done for decades making the criminal out to be the victim and the victim out to be the criminal. And if you go to Palestine and you actually experience uh, what they're dealing with there, I don't know how you can't become emotionally engaged and attached because the types of things that people are experiencing there on a daily basis are beyond what most of us can comprehend, much less deal with. Most of us would wither and die under the weight of the injustice that these people are dealing with every single day. And even worse, being made out to be the real criminal. <laughs> this is propaganda at its best, and behind that propaganda is one of the reasons why I'll be called a loose cannon and whatnot, because I'm not politically correct. And I will not kowtow to any group of people, whether it's the right or the left. And in fact, in my opinion, the left is more disgusting in the way it's been perverted and corrupted on so many different levels. This is part of the reason why you can imagine why I'm not very much liked by a lot of people in the so-called left or whatever. Um, I will not pander to any one group or people or anything like that. I will simply speak what I believe to be the truth. And if I'm wrong, call me on it but otherwise I'm not going to bow. The reason why the Palestinians were able to be victimized as badly as they have been was because of the myth that most of us are unwilling to explore or really look at. And in fact, in European countries, you can go to jail for even questioning it, and that is the Holocaust. You know, as soon as you even mention that word and challenge the, the accepted version of history, immediately get ready. The moment you do it, and there are some very brave and courageous people who have spoken about this issue and, and done so truthfully, who've helped open the door for the rest of us to kind of follow. But even to this day, there's no question that this subject is untouchable. If you want to climb that social ladder, you better not touch this subject. And it's directly related, of course, to the next word that you can't say unless you say it in a politically correct way, and that is Jew or Jewish. You can't say it's the Jewish state of Israel with getting the wrath of people who want to try and protect these crimes and maintain the status quo and yet it is the Jewish state of Israel that's not my definition that's exactly what it is any Jew on the planet can go back to Palestine a land that is not in, uh, historically theirs by any reasonable definition the people who are now inhabiting Palestine do not have any genetic ties to that land. The vast majority of them do not, where in fact, obviously, Palestinians do. They are a Semitic people, and those who have come there are not even Semitic in the real definition of the word.
many of them. If you even touch these words, you're immediately brandished and, and you're immediately vilified and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is that if, we, if I give an example, it illustrates why we must explore these subjects. If I say that America, that America, Americans are responsible for the greatest crimes in the history of our world, that Americans are responsible for genocide, are responsible for mass murder, are responsible for corruption in every corner of this planet. If I say that Americans are responsible for that, that's not a problem. In fact, in these days, you can say that, and you'll probably be applauded more often than not. It's very fashionable to uh, sling arrows at the United States. But if I say that the Jewish people are responsible for the actions of the Jewish state of Israel, I don't say that because every single Jew is responsible for the actions. Of course not. That would be ridiculous to say that. I don't believe every single American is responsible for the actions of America. However, I do consider the American people as a whole responsible for the actions of their government. And I think that the converse of that, to believe that no, we're not responsible, is the biggest danger of all, because unless we're willing to take responsibility for the actions of those who we pay our taxes to and who sit up on those podiums and pretend to be our representatives, unless we are willing to take responsibility for these actions, then what chance do we have for changing their course? Who's going to change course if we don't take responsibility as people? What, are they going to do it for us? Are they going to change of their own free will? Was the UN going to come and save us? Who's going to come in and save us if we don't take personal and collective responsibility for the actions of these bastard criminals who are nothing more than puppets representing the real powers that be? And the real powers which we can identify, absolutely, without question. I believe there are many layers of separation behind these powers physically. I do. And, you know, I look from... I look at different sources of information, and I can't say I understand conclusively exactly what is behind these powers that we can physically identify. But no question about it, if you want to know power, then you have to understand the financial system. You have to understand who prints the money. Who are the people who control the issuance of money? The world is perfectly aligned right now as a result of this system. It's exactly as it should be with that system. When you give private control of the issuance of money to a small group of psychopaths and you understand the power that comes with that, then you understand virtually every single subject that we want to talk about. Because those that will gravitate to the high positions of trust and responsibility will be the most corrupt, vile, and disgusting criminals possible. Brian gave a perfect example with this woman who was promoted from one job to the next, the more disgusting, vile, and corrupt you are, and generally you have to be compromised as well. So it's very useful if we have a videotape of you uh, buggering a little boy or a little girl. That's very valuable. Probably not going to be speaking out against any kind of positions of power or anybody in positions of power if we have that type of stuff. So those make the best puppets of all, heavily compromised. But who really owns and controls them? It's the banking institutions. I don't even know how we could argue about this. You know, this is a fact. And as long, as long as we allow the private control and issuance of money, we are not going to be able to make a better world. It is not possible to have those two in the same parallel existence. It's simply not possible. It is the head of the snake. No question about it. And ultimately, the favorite plaything of these bankers is the state of Israel. I mean, that's like their favorite little plaything. You know, the whole point of Israel is to maintain perpetual conflict. I mean, everything it does, you'd have to be a complete idiot to think that Israel has any interest in peace. That's exactly the opposite of its whole point. And it does a very good job. Historically, it's done a fantastic job of inciting the kind of hatred and bitterness that justifies our preemptive wars and whatnot, you know, and these bogeyman 9-11 false flag. It fits in so importantly. And that is why, ultimately, I gravitated towards Palestine. Initially, intuitively, something told me there's something about Palestine. I was totally ignorant 
about Palestine, as most Americans are. And when I looked at it, I realized, you know what, there's no question about it. The fate of Palestine is the fate of the world. If we do not solve the problem of Palestine, we will not solve our problems either. In fact, it's just like that famous quote, I'll paraphrase it from uh, World War II, uh, Pastor Niemöller, I think his name was. First they came for the Jews, but, but I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists. Uh, I wasn't a trade unionist. And eventually they came for me, and when I needed help, there was no one there to help me. That's the Palestinians. They're the proverbial canary in the coal mine. They're what is coming to us eventually. And I agree with Brian wholeheartedly. What is the point of these people in power, if they're even people, <laughs> which is a whole other subject? They certainly have no humanity. There's no question of that. There's no humanity in these individuals. The point is to, is to control all of us that they need for their slave population and ultimately to get rid of those of us who aren't necessary. And I think you know, the amount of evidence to show that there is a, a real intention to depopulate a large segment of the human population is tremendous, tremendous. And I've believed for some time that what we have is a true, a classic case of things coming to a head, really coming to a head. And eventually it's really going to smack full on. It's going to have the forces of darkness, of Satanism, of corruption, of violence, confronting the force of humanity, true humanity, a sane human population. And those two things, when they fully collide, is going to result in something that is, is going to define the fate of our planet. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. This is what drives me, because I, don't, I didn't need to be a father, but I am a father now. And I know that my children, just like your children, have no future unless we sort this mess out. We cannot sustain what we are doing in this planet to the point where we have even today, you know, these son of a bitches at the top of the pyramid in the media trying to convince us into a war in Syria, which of course is that one step closer to a war with Iran. And if that happens, I defy anyone to tell me otherwise. If we have a war with Iran, it's not an absolute guarantee, but it is for sure, for sure, this close to World War III and this close to nuclear annihilation. And we have to understand, we have to understand that those that are in power are such psychopaths. You'd, if you want to understand this world, exercise number one. If you want to understand this world, you're going to have to step out of sanity. Don't think from a sane perspective because it's not going to work. It's going to be tremendously confusing. And you're not going to understand it. So you need to think from the view of a tyrant, of a psychopath. You need to get into that mindset to understand how these, an intelligent one, not, not a stupid one, I mean, an intelligent, psychopathic, violent vampire, basically. Get into that mindset and you'll understand. So to think that we couldn't have these people who, uh, if you think sanely, you think, well, well yeah, well, why would they want to start a third world? Why would they launch nuclear weapons? You know, what? Come on, you know, they live on the planet too. Well, hold on a second. That's sanity. Get out of your sanity. Get insane. Think of that way. Think in that term. Okay? Now you can understand. These people individuals, whatever they are, these individuals are clearly capable of anything. And for them, again, it would be really stupid of us to ignore the fact that there are underground compounds. We know this. This is not a secret. Do you have an invitation to one, by the way? Does anybody in this room have an invitation in the third? No one? Oh, do you? Okay, we've got one. Watch that guy, man. I don't have my invitation, you know. And none of you have your invitation. But if we have a third world war, I can assure you, those that have been the protectors of this tyranny, the key ones that they rely on, they're going to have their ticket to the underground compound to ride it out. You think that's not possible? You need to think again. It is distinctly possible. In fact, I would argue it's highly likely if, if, if they feel they can get away with it. That's the only thing stopping them, in my opinion, I think quite frankly, that an attack on Iran was part of the script, and it would have happened by now. I think that they have sent out their focus groups and done their little feelers with their key individuals, 
And everything they're getting back is that part of the puzzle is not in place. Uh, that's a liability over there, and that's a liability over there. And if they, if they flip the switch, if they give the order, if they do the false flag, the 9-11 type event to you know, create the motivating, catalyzing event to justify attacking Iran, and we get launched into a third world war, I feel pretty, pretty confident, although I'm not resting on this conclusion and I don't know that it's true, that they know that if it goes wrong, that's it. It's going to be the first domino and a whole lot of dominoes that are going to bring this whole system of tyranny down. They know that if they, move, if they make this move and it doesn't work, hanging from a lamppost will be about the best they could hope for, literally. I'm, I'm not a vengeful person myself. I don't, I don't want to see vengeance because I see even these psychopaths as ultimate victims as well. Most of these people have no idea what it is that they're doing. They're completely mind-controlled. They have no humanity in them. These people are to be the most pitied of all. If you ask me, the most precious thing we have as human beings is our humanity. Take that away from someone and what do you have? You have nothing. It's nothing at all. And these people have no humanity. I would love to see some of them somehow get their humanity back. That would be much more fulfilling to me than to see them hanging from lampposts. But I don't have any doubt that many of them are going to be hanging from lampposts if they try their stuff and it doesn't work. And I can't blame the people, such as the people in Palestine, for feeling that they need to feel a real sense of retribution and act it out. Because the things that I've seen and the stories that I've been told of what people have experienced in Palestine are so horrendous that it, it's hard for most to imagine. It really is hard. And I, on that note, I mean, I did say I would talk about Palestine. I'll tell you one story from Palestine about the Samuni family. Does anybody know the, who the Samuni family is in here? Wow. The Samuni family is a big, big family. They live in Zaytun in Gaza. And they live in a rural area. Most of Gaza, it's one of the most densely populated places on the planet, as most of you probably know. Um, so obviously it's mostly uh, urban. But this is a rural area, and it's a farming area. And they're a farming family. Every time the Israelis go on a rampage, they always go into this area, and it splits the Gaza Strip in two when they control this area. So during Operation Cast Lead four years ago, uh, the Israelis went into this area. They took it over, totally took it over. They were killing people left, right, and center. One of the Samuni family members, uh, one of the Samuni family groups, had uh, their, their father in front of the mother and the children, eight children at that point, executed, as this was sort of the beginning, sort of the warm-up, uh, executed the father right in front of the kids and the mother. Uh, left him lying there, pinned them in a house, uh, lit a fire inside the house with the mother and the kids, and basically they barely survived uh, while the Israelis were laughing outside the house. Every time they got up, they were shooting into the house. It was like a game for them. It, it was just like, this is fun. And you have to understand that the, the rabbis, many of the rabbis contracted out by the IDF, literally the Israeli Defense Forces, Offense Forces, that uh, it, they were using Talmudic Judaism madness to whip up these Israeli soldiers into a state of being in which the Palestinians, not only were they not even human, they weren't even dogs. In fact, they're worse than dogs. They're, they're your enemy and, a, and less than a dog. And, and if you have any compassion for them, you're, 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 a, you're an affront to God because God said that you must destroy these people. You must show them no mercy. And literally, you had that kind of dogma told by leaders within their own religious circles, whipping these people up. So this explains a lot about the kinds of things that these people did. I mean, how do you do this? A, a mother and her children, for Christ's sake, a, one of them was just a year old, a baby. Anyway, they killed, the, they killed the father. They ultimately shot one of the kids, Ahmed, four years old. There's a very well-seen picture of Ahmed. He's got two holes in his chest. He died over a day and a half in his mother's arms. They would not allow him to get any medical attention. So 
she sat there and held little Ahmed in, in her arms for a day and a half. They ordered the family into a house, one house. Anyway, they ordered the family into a house. And there were about 100 family members in the house. And they hit it with, uh, sorry, I've never done this before. I've told this story before <sighs> many times. They hit the house. And about 29 family members were killed almost right away. The situation in this house was, you know, you can imagine, I mean, we're talking a room half the size of this room, less than that, 100 family members, imagine. They hit it with rockets, they hit it with three rockets, um, blood and guts everywhere. You had children lying next to the corpses of their parents, you had parents lying next to the corpses, corpses of their children. When they ventured out to try and get medical attention, they were shot at. For four days, they were not allowed. Medical people were aware that this family had been hit. There was horrendous casualties and so on and so forth. Medical services, the Red Crescent Society and whatnot tried to get into the area. They were refused. And, and ultimately, for four days in winter, no food, no water, no electricity, no medical help, four days lying there next to the corpse of your little brother, your mother, your father, four days. <laughs> so this family just has been through something that most of you, uh, you know, I mean, come on. And yet these kids are just amazing. They really are amazing. You know, some of them you can really just see that bright, bright light in them. You know, they just need a little, little bit of help, you know, and they're going to they're gonna be so important, so beautiful to just be able to tell their story and hopefully someday to be able to let go of some of that anger, that righteous anger they feel and hatred for this monster that they've been facing for so long. You know, and that's the potential I see in, in Palestine. And, and this is why I get arrested for fraud, you know. <laughs> I mean, ultimately I made a, a, a commitment to the Palestinian people some time ago. And, you know, I've put myself in positions where clearly I've, it was a bit dangerous, to say the least, especially on the Mavi Marmara. Uh, the fact that I'm here today says, you know, God or the universe, something's looking after me. Because I, I, I go back and look at my experience on that ship, what I did involved in disarming a couple of Israeli commandos, taking a 9 millimeter pistol off of one of these commandos and having that in my hand for five minutes before I figured out to take the bullets out. And then, you know, hide it as evidence. That's why I didn't just throw it overboard. I mean, the fact that I, I ran around with, with a 9mm pistol like this in that position with helicopters with snipers on it and, and didn't get hit uh, is, is pretty, pretty amazing. I'm a, I'm a fortunate man. I've been extremely blessed, looked at from many different levels. So being arrested for fraud is, you know, whatever, par for the course. But ultimately, there isn't enough that I could do for, for these people. It's, it's just, there's no way we could do too much for these people. And I think they really represent, you know, us, our future. If, if we can rectify the situation and try and, and help them heal, then we will heal as well because we are responsible, you know, especially in the UK and America. We are directly responsible for, for what happened to the Samuni family and so many other families. We are the ones that pay the taxes that are being used to commit these crimes. Flat out, we are responsible. And, you know, unless we're willing to take responsibility, these things are going to continue to the point where it's not going to be the Samuni family, it's going to be us. It's going to be your family. It's going to be your little boy or little girl who you're going to see with his arms and head blown off and blood everywhere. What used to be your child is now nothing but a big bloody mess of nothing. And really, it is coming. It's coming our way. 
And so for me, I would like for us to start taking more responsibility, understanding that we do have the capacity to affect the change that we wish to see in this world. And in fact, I'm really quite inspired by what I see, as dark as this world is, and boy, oh boy, is it dark. If you want to go into the rabbit hole, boy, it gets darker and darker and darker. There's no question of that. It is an incredibly, incredibly nasty reality for so many. But as we seek the truth, in my opinion, it is truly, truly the one thing that can set us free. And more and more people are seeking that. That's obvious. There's no question. More and more people are seeking to know the truth. They're not buying the Guardian or the Independent or the Telegraph or this stuff. You know, you look at the income revenues for these. I don't think any, all of their books are cooked as far as I'm concerned. I don't believe any of them have viable business models. But, of course, the bankers, the rulers of the earth, they own all these comp companies, all of them. I mean, it's the show thing, you know, each one is separate. They're all connected, the big ones. And through this matrix of corruption and fraud and cooking the books and whatnot, they're trying to maintain the illusion. And as, as you become more astute and uh, more aware, for instance, you know, having been to Palestine, having met people on the ground, having researched it, I mean, when you contrast the reality with what they present, you can't actually see a tremendous change that has occurred. If you were to talk about Palestine 10 years ago, oh my God, I mean, the level of hideous propaganda that, as I said, maintain the mythical Jews are the victims and they're facing this radical Islamic psychopathic enemy who wants to drive them all into the sea and the poor, poor Jews, the poor Israelis, you know, that narrative was the standard. And you've seen over you know, the years a change, a radical change. Why is that? Is it because those in the media have come to understand the truth? No, of course not. They knew the truth back then. The reason why things have changed, and I'm not saying that it's in any way acceptable, but if you look at the news with regard to Palestine and the way it is reported now and the way it was reported back then is a huge difference. And that difference is directly as a direct result of, of us. It's us who made that happen. It's not enough, obviously, but the point is that we are the movers. We are the ones that lead. People of conscience are the ones that matter. The people, the masses, to put it bluntly, don't really matter so much. The masses will follow. They always do. And they follow whatever rubbish is put in front of them. This is the way it is. In this mind-controlled state of ours, from the first moment to the last, we are bombarded with all sorts of indoctrination and propaganda methods that control our minds, literally. And I have a story, actually, I wanted to talk to Brian about when our son was born two months early uh, in this country and I just didn't know my, our rights, you know, and, and ultimately they stuck our little baby boy, first child, in a box and, you know, we're keeping him in an incubator and telling, telling us that our child couldn't be picked up because he needed to rest and then when we wanted to have him breastfed, uh, they said, no, 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 he'll aspirate, he'll choke on, on he doesn't know how because he's... They wanted to take our newborn baby, stick him in a box, not have mother touch him, not breastfeed him, and keep him in there for about two months before he... Think about it. What is that going to do? to you? And this is the kind of trauma from the first to the last. And it's so, it's so institutionalized that most people think it's just normal. This is the world we're living in. So, I mean, the vast majority of people are under a spell. And they just don't even know what's happening. They live in an alternate universe programmed for them by those that are enslaving us, literally. So the ones that, that are aware of this and coming into the truth, they're really, we're the only ones that matter in this paradigm. When we achieve the ultimate goal, if indeed we do achieve that goal, which for me, my goal, and this is, you know, to the day I die, this is my goal, a better world, a just world. A sane world. If I had one word, sane. Sanity. We are not sane. We are collectively insane. So insane that we threaten our very own existence and all life on this planet. And we have done so for many decades now. We are this close, <laughs> this close, perhaps one false flag event away 
from the end of the world as we know it. Or we could, we could radically transform this world and literally see changes that will be shocking in a good way if we address the issues and continue doing what, what it is I think we're all here for, and that is seeking the truth. Don't underestimate the power of arming yourself with wisdom and knowledge and sharing that with your friends and your family. This is critical, absolutely critical. In fact, it's one of the key ways that, that the powers that be used to slander me is, you know, saying I'm this, that, and the other. They private message and email and all that. They don't do it publicly as much because that can be responded to. So they do it privately. So they, this just is an indication of the power of this. You know, word of mouth, passing on information. You know, these, these are the things that are going to change the world for the better or for the worse. And in my opinion, we have a great chance. We have a great chance in the not too distant future. Of course, we've got December 21st coming up. A lot of people are pinning a lot of hope on that, I think, or, you know, nutcase Christians are you know, looking for the, <laughs> the end times and so on and so forth. I think, yeah, it would be a mistake for us to pin our hopes on any one thing or anyone but ourselves. We need to look within, first and foremost. Look within, be honest with ourselves, face the world squarely, and, and clearly what's happening right now is more and more people are doing that. And as more and more of us do this, we get closer and closer to that ultimate goal, which is a better world, a world where all of us can live a life that is dignified, where our children have a future, and where we respect our planet as we would our mother and actually thrive and flourish and celebrate our differences. You know, and this is, this is really, to me, one of the another methods of control which is so amazing. You know, they want to pin us into a group, you know, and they want us to, to look to, you know, that's, that's how I feel. They want to have us accept and adopt a label. You know, and that's why I, I guess intuitively I knew, like, there is no label. I just don't know a label. Even human rights activists and whatnot, okay, but, you know, I'm just a human. <laughs> I'm just a human. That's it. I'm just a sane human who wants other people to be able to live a sane and dignified life. That's all. That's my group. You want to call me a group. So I'm very, very hopeful. But I think we need to understand Palestine. We need to understand the relationship it has to the powers that be and to the control method. We need to understand that virtually every kind of issue we can name, whether it's issues internally in the UK or whether it's issues abroad internationally, every single one of them is connected and they all come back to the same basic power structure that's control of the money. We have to change this. We have to change it. And you know, you see someone like Ron Paul in the United States, you know, I, I, it's another example of how amazing the method of control is. Whatever you think of Ron Paul, you know, wh whatever you think of him, the fact that a man like that was on that kind of platform and was talking about the Federal Reserve and the need to get rid of it, I don't know how you can't love him for that. This is so important, so important. How many Americans who had no idea what the Federal Reserve really was are at least aware of it now? How many? Ron Paul is a huge part of that. And, and the fact that a guy can get up and say that, and some will say it's controlled opposite. Well, wow, what advantage does it really have for the powers that be to have their whole fraudulent system exposed? Come on. You know, of course they try and co-opt everything once it's already there. But the bottom line is more and more people aware. If we change the financial system, and you know, it would take a whole other hour or more to talk about what alternatives we could use. But there are viable alternatives out there. There are ways that we can use money to the benefit of people. It doesn't have to be an evil thing. It can be something that we use to facilitate trade and exchange that actually facilitates the betterment of our society and actually rewards honorable people. <laughs> imagine that. Can you imagine a world where we actually rewarded people because of their honor and integrity. Everything is upside down. I bring it back to the beginning. The most corrupt, disgusting, pathetic, violent, servile, nasty bastards at the top and all the people who have any kind of integrity or honor are either killed, imprisoned, marginalized, ridiculed, 
So it's a great compliment to be called a loose cannon, to be called a fraudster, to be charged with fraud by the very fraudulent institutions of the UK police and the government here. It's a great compliment to be called a terrorist operative of Hamas, which the IDF has said I am. Literally, you can go online, they say I'm a terrorist operative of Hamas. Wow. So the Israelis are calling me a terrorist. Thank you very much. I feel tremendously honored. Of course, I have a laugh about it, but you know, this is kind of serious stuff. You know, and, and even on a recent trip, and I'm going to wind it up here, but on a recent trip to the US, you know, I was called up by the FBI, and I'll tell you this because I think it's indicative of what kind of changes are happening here. Uh, I was called up by the FBI. Actually, they left a message at the business I created, diving business in Hawaii. So they, the FBI called up the, the dive shop and said, oh, yeah, we'd like to speak to Ken. Uh, this is Special Agent so-and-so from the FBI. <laughs> so here's Ken. All right, they already know a little bit about me. Ken's back in town, and we're getting a call from the FBI. Um, and anyway, he left a message. I called him back, and I, I said, uh, yeah, okay, what, what can I do for you? He was very nice. He said, um, yeah, you know, we know you've had some problems with your travel and whatnot, um, and uh, we'd like to talk to you about that, clear some things up. I said, yeah, what is it? The Israelis saying I'm a terrorist operative of Hamas again. I said, yeah, 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 they're saying that. I said, okay, yeah, fine. So we set up a time to meet, and, and he came to my mother's house where I was staying, and we sat and talked for a couple hours. Um, this was just two months ago. And, and when I was in Hawaii a couple years before that, I was also had a meeting with a special agent of the FBI for about two hours, three hours. We got along great, no problems at all. So anyway, he came and we talked, and he basically told me, he said, look, we know this is bullshit. We don't really like the Israelis. You know, he told me effectively they're sick and tired of this shit, and you know, they know it's crap, and they just want to get a statement from me to help try and correct it so that Homeland Security stops harassing me. You know, and, and I think that is indicative of the kinds of change that we're seeing here. You know, because I am really an enemy of the state by any, you know, normal definition of the word, big time. If I were Muslim or Arab, where would I be right now? Uh, I'd be in Guantanamo or, or Bagram or something like that. There is no way that I would be roaming around saying what I'm saying if I was being accused of being a terrorist operative of Hamas by the Israelis. I mean, come on, how much power did they have? And I'm walking around only because I'm white and I'm Western and I've been able to articulate some things that will be amplified a thousand times or more if I'm put in prison. This is really the only thing protecting me, quite frankly. And if, I, if I'm to die, for the record, by the way, I will never commit suicide. <laughs> and if I'm ever involved in any violence, it's purely a self-defense, and, and I hope never to have to do that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much blessed and honored by my experiences in Palestine, to be honest, is probably the greatest blessing, certainly one of the greatest blessings. The people of Palestine, they have their own problems. The Arabs are their own worst enemies on many different levels. I'm not going to romanticize it. You know, they've got their own issues. But ultimately, you know, what they've experienced for decades is so horrendous, and they have not become the monster that has oppressed them. This is beautiful really beautiful that, that people can endure that type of thing and not hate, just blindly hate. And you know, proof of that is six months I spent in Gaza last year walking the streets on my own on a regular basis. You know, how does a guy, an um, ex-Marine who served in a war from America, the country that's bankrolling their oppression, walk the streets of Gaza for six months? You know, I mean really. If it, were hap if it happened to us, if it happened to the British people, or God forbid the American people, American society is a violent society to begin with. I mean, my God, if you put that population through that type of occupation and oppression, oh, my God, would the blood be flowing. And yet the Palestinians have been through all that, and they're not like that. They're not monsters. They're not. They're beautiful people. They really exemplify the best qualities of humanity on so many different levels. And that's why it really is an honor to be able to try and represent their cause in the very best way that I can. When we have justice in Palestine, it is my firm belief that we will have justice in this world very shortly after. Or they'll happen in unison. I genuinely believe that. So if you're not too aware of Palestine, I would encourage you 
to look at it a little bit deeper and try and make that connection between what's happening there and what's happening to us in the rest of the world and how that tyranny is so directly connected. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate all of your time. Uh, I don't know how long I've spoken. I never script anything. It's always straight from the heart. So much love and respect to all of you for coming. And